that it's happening everywhere, every single place on earth. There's some form of extraction that is happening. Our people are really still dealing with the cancer rates, with the contaminated water, with the contaminated soil. The community isn't, you know, like a gendered thing. It is about who is willing to put themselves out there, who is fighting for someone. And there's been this huge push for decolonization. I like to use the word re-indigenize. We can really change the policies if we have the power of numbers back home. Coming up on The Laura Flanders Show, the place where the people who say it can't be done take a back seat to the people who are doing it. Welcome. Seven languages, three continents. The film Powerlands is not your usual documentary. In it, director Ivy Camille Menibidso travels from her home in the southwest of the U.S. to Colombia, the Philippines, Mexico, and the Standing Rock Reservation to meet indigenous people up against big extractive corporations. The communities she visits are all deeply connected to their local specific places and people and cultures. They're linked too in that they're being ravaged by some of the very same corporations with names like, well among them, Peabody Coal and BHP Petroleum. Powerlands paints a picture of places in struggle that are building power in parallel with one another. Is what she's tracing a sort of trans-local and trans-generational indigenous movement that is building across the continents? And can it succeed against the most powerful corporations on earth? According to the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change's latest and last report, 21st century humans must either transform or burn up. So do the people of the Powerlands have lessons to teach us all? Seven years ago, The Laura Flanders Show aired a report based on some of the early footage gathered for Powerlands. Today, I'm excited to welcome to the program Ivy Camille Menibidso, the director, and Kim Smith, one of the organizers who appears in the film. They are both back with the finished product that is already winning awards. Ivy Camille is a self-described queer Navajo filmmaker. Kim Smith is a community organizer. They are both members of the Diné, or Navajo Nation. Powerlands, produced by our former producer Jordan Flaherty, along with Eva Jashevitz, with Emily Faye Ratner, with music by Daniel French, is available for streaming through Fuse now. Well, to kick things off, here is the beginning of the documentary Powerlands, where Ivy Camille Menibidso introduces us to the journey she's about to take. My family can trace our history to 85 generations with this land. I began working on this film to document our community's struggle against resource colonization. Along the way, I found that we are not alone. This is a story of indigenous people protecting and rebuilding. Multinational corporations like Glencore, Peabody, and BHP have been extracting hundreds of billions of dollars in profit. It is happening in nearly every country on Earth. First came colonization, now corporations are stealing the resources from under our feet. This extraction is global, but so is our resistance. From Dineta, I connected with indigenous people in Colombia, the Philippines, and Mexico, who are uniting to protect the earth. We are appealing to public opinion, changing laws, and putting our bodies on the line. This film is part of that resistance. Kim, Ivy, Camille, welcome to the program. Congratulations on the film. What a journey the film has been on since we last saw any glimpse of it. And what a journey you've been on, Ivy, Camille. Let, let's start with you. Did I read right that you started this film when you were 19 years old? Um, what set you off on your on your project? 
Um, yeah, so we started um, at 19 and actually Jordan and I met in Flagstaff, Arizona. He had just come back from Columbia and mutual friends had put us in contact and we were talking about the differences and similarities between Black Mesa and Columbia. And I'm from Black Mesa, it's where I was born, raised. You know, the conversation really began rolling and we found that there were more similarities than there were differences. Um, from the food to the clothing to even the same corporation was affecting both of these communities. And that's really where it really began. And at first we started to look, should we follow the corporation? Do we follow an emotional journey? What do we go with? And then um, we reached out to like 20 different communities all over. The industries you're up against have shaped your lives. Your subjects, your colleagues in the documentary talk poignantly about what they're up against. But if, Kim, you were to tell your story of how coal has affected you, um, what would you say? Um, I come from, uh, on the Arizona side, uh, St. Michael's, Arizona, and then on the New Mexico side from Miyambito, New Mexico. Um, and really, it is a part of the huge hub of extractive industries that power the Southwest. Um, three miles from three miles east of me is one of the biggest open pit coal mines. And then two miles to the south of me is El Paso gas line, which, you know, connects the Permian Basin to um, the greater Southwest region. Um, and, you know, this has really just affected my life it, tremendously, first of all, um, through health impacts. Um, I have an autoimmune disease um, that, you know, is known to come from extractive industries. There is cancer and different diseases from the extractive industry in my family and in my community. Um, and so aside from that, there is a lot of policy um, both within the national level, regional level, and tribal level that is really pushing to continue those extractive industries to be um, powered by our nation and by our resources. And what about you, Ivy Camille? How, In what ways is this a personal story for you around coal? Yeah, so um, I'm from Black Mesa. That's where my mom and dad met. My grandmother, Meso, has been um, fighting this resistance since the beginning. Um, I'm from the HPL side, the Hopi partition land side. Um, in that before the 1960s, it was NPL Navajo partition lands. Um, and so my entire life, I've seen my entire family get um, forcibly relocated off of this region, um, you know, losing their house, their cattle, and friends and family throughout everything, as well as seeing the, the health impacts that happen um, all across the board. But also growing up, you know, having a white side and growing up in town in Flagstaff, I also see the long-term effects that this um, polluting can do, not just in these communities. You know, we are seeing um, how the depletion of the water um, from the aquifer underneath, how it's affecting this ent the entire Southwest, Southwest region um, through fires and floods. And all of this is just going to have like long-term um, effects on the land and on people. Our people are really still dealing with the cancer rates, with the contaminated water, with the contaminated soil. Um, with radiate people living in um, radiating homes and schools, you know, so there's all of these things that are underlying. Now, these petitions, petition lines that you talked about, for people that don't know, what, what were they? What are they? And how did they change the landscape? Yeah, so in uh, the early 1950s, when the starts were talking between um, the federal government mining, co mining coalitions and the Navajo and Hopi nations, the Navajo Nation said no, and the Hopi Nation said yes. So they went in, and on top of, if you took a like a, a res map, and you took a mineral map and laid them on top of each other, you would see where the coal seam was, re where the reservation line was redrawn along the coal seam. And that was given towards Hopi partition lands. And it was a way to separate and isolate two sister tribes. We're considered a national sacrifice zone like by the federal government. And so what that means is it opens up industry to come in and do their exploratory drilling, to do all of these things. And so that partly is why there are there has been the largest uranium spill in this nation um, on, in, on Dine land. Your film, it seems to me, has the agenda of bringing people together, if not physically, at least in the same film, to connect people, to show the connections that exist across borderlands, across cultures, languages, you name it, seven languages in the film. Wow. Um, is that part of the motivation or was there a, a sort of family prompt to do the work that you do, Ivy Camille? So I was raised in, with the idea of ke, which is this Navajo word that means relationships. 
um, being all around us, being all of us. And there's even this thing, community that people are working with right now, because the best or the simplest translation is relationship, but embodies so much more. But it's that thing that we all have with each other and with the air and with the plants around us and with the water around us. And to know that if anything's going to happen, it has to be done in solidarity. So that's probably what makes your film so important, Ivy Camille. Um, but if you could explain a little bit why you decide to tell more than just the Black Mesa story. And I don't mean to say just, it's a huge story. But from there, you travel all across the continent um, and to the Philippines. Why? So talking to Jordan about Colombia, that's really when it was like, oh, my God, where else is this happening? And it turned out that it's happening everywhere. It's happening across England. It's happening across Ireland. It's happening across Canada and Mexico and South America and North America and every single continent, every single place on Earth. There's some form of um, extraction that is happening. And so in that beginning, and that's really where it went down to, was one, not to like educate those who already know um, to remind them that we are still here, to remind each other that we are still here and we all support each other. And if you are in solidarity, if you are fighting, we are currently still here together and we still honor you in support. Um, but also to ask people, what can you do in your own backyard? Was it just coincidence that everywhere you went, women seemed to be in leadership of these resistance struggles? Yeah, yeah, that was it. And honestly, it happens way more frequently. Um, Navajo is a matriarchal society. I always grew up with the women commanding the room and I never questioned it. And it wasn't really until other people started watching the film that they were like, hey, there's like a lot of women. And I was like, oh, I guess you're right. <laughs> yep. Um, that's just how it was. And community isn't, you know, like a gendered thing. It is about who um, is willing to put themselves out there, who who is fighting for someone. And a lot of times that often comes and starts with mothers or grandmothers or aunties. Um, as I am for few, you know, and so that's that's really where it come from is from love and from caring and for wanting something better for somebody else. How does your work as an organizer um, across generations intersect with this this work of the movie? After the film, I did a lot of um, visiting of indigenous resistance camps. I went to Unistoten, Leilu Island. Um, that's what led me to Standing Rock, the Buffalo Field Campaign, um, the RNC, you know, all of these different um, places, resistance camps and helping in the kitchen. You know, I do a lot of food work and food really um, is like such medicine for the soul. And a lot of times when you're on the front lines, you don't really have a, a good meal. This really led me to understand and study, um, maybe not study, but um, really see how other resistance movements are, what they're resisting, how they're resisting, um, and really see the intersects and and then really compare it to my own community and how we're trying to defend the land. There's a huge lack of infrastructure in our communities and um, housing is one of them. There's a huge housing, housing crisis and it came to the point where it's like, why am I going to all of these places when I don't really have a roof over my head? And so from that, it started this process of like, how do I move home? What does that look like? And then it goes into the policy of the um, relationship between the federal government and my people. The first step was really looking at what types of toxins are in the soil. We've cleaned up about five acres of illegal landfills in the area um, that were building sustainable structures. Were there things that surprised you that you learned um, from the film around people doing similar sorts of resistance in, in Mexico, the Philippines, Colombia? Yeah, I definitely think it's one of the movements that has really happened. There's been this huge push for decolonization. I like to use the word re-indigenize because decolonization means to take or, you know, lose something at this point. We saw it in... Um, Oaxaca with their community work that they were doing. I mean, part of their way of resistance was literally just pulling trees into the road to like help block cars. And that was really amazing and really beautiful to see, to see them rallying around the sandbars. Um, seeing it in, Philipp in the Philippines, they're using it with um, their plants and their medicines and they're bringing everyone back to the to care for these plants that have been in this area for generations and generations. And to see that same 
work going on across the world. We're going to go to a trailer now for the film Powerlands. In this part, the mobilization against the Dakota Access Pipeline is heating up on the Standing Rock Reservation. Kim Smith is there, along with LaDonna Brave Bull Allard who was a matriarch of the water protector movement and was very active in that place at that time. They're trying to say we don't exist. We are indigenous people to this land. We have the roots growing right out of our feet. We belong here. It's not just our community that's affected this way. There's so many indigenous communities. There's so many people of color that have to face these realities every day. We are not separate from our environment. And we have been damaged in this whole process of being colonized. We show up to actions with, with just ourselves, with our prayers, with our voices, and that's power. That's the power that makes them shiver in their little SWAT gear. You put our backs against the wall, we put one foot in front of the other and we face the storm like our brothers the buffalo. We face the storm. We are not backing down ever again. Standing Rock did change things, though, for the movement and also on the ground. Kim, you were one of the first people, I think, there in that mobilization, setting up that kitchen that you referred to. How do you assess the difference that the Standing Rock mobilization and the reaction to it made, um, both there in the Dakotas and, and where you are? Um, well, Standing Rock really showed us um, what is to come. Um, especially when you look at the police state, the military force, um, imperialism in this in this country. Um, and, you know, not only did we learn a lot, but the police police state learned a lot about what our um, resistance looks like. And quite frankly, they have a billion dollar budget and we don't have that kind of budget. And so it, it's really eye opening and you're seeing it all over the world that, you know, the militarization in the police state um, have all of this heavy machinery to um, take and kill what they see is in their past uh, in their path. One thing that we um, understand is that a lot of our comrades are now caught up in uh, the prison system. If you're in the front lines, you are now considered an eco terror terrorist. Um, and so there's, they're really coming down um, hard on us. And so um, it is really important, as Ivy Camille had mentioned, for us to really be home and look at what, wh how are we going to um, defend our homelands? What does that look like? You mentioned money, and that put me in mind of the Biden administration's announced green transition funds. Um and we should say that there's been a lot of change come to your homelands there at the Dinita in that I think it's three of the um, big plants have, have closed, um, coal-fired plants feeding the southwest there are, are closing at least. There is this money being announced. Will you, will indigenous organizers, activists, the community be seeing any of that? No, we won't. <laughs> we won't. <laughs> There, so the process to get any type of federal grant, it, you have to, it's like a whole, it's not accessible to our people. And yeah, there's, there's, we're seeing some of the money through our roads and things like that, but nothing when it comes to healthcare, um, nothing when it comes to like any type of cleanup, especially when it comes to like, let's say the San Juan generating station, the Navajo generating station. These are power plants that have closed. And some of the work that we do is making sure that these states are including indigenous peoples in the negotiations, but also making sure that there are reparations that go to our communities on our terms, not our government's terms, not the federal government's terms or the state's terms. And a huge part of the funding isn't going to help when our health is heavily impacted um, for generations. Coming to you, Ivy Camille, you have said in your discussion of Powerlands, which screened during Climate Week in New York and is getting awards and winning acclaim, you've said that it is a kind of how-to guide in, in some ways. Um, that being the case, 
what would you lift up as tactics um, that have emerged during your research that you think are particularly interesting or, or potentially fruitful? So many different types. Again, community organization, as we see in Oaxaca. Um, there's also the, you know, more radical, violent side that we saw in the Philippines with NPA, New People's Army, um, which brings up the question, is it more violent to not pick up arms um, when you are being threatened with violence at all times? Um, and so then we also see peaceful protest um, through Standing Rock and we see um, community work in Black Mesa. I think there's so many different types. And actually, while on tour, I found my favorite type um ever which was uh in this tiny it's, it's a small town in northern england called preston england and several years ago they were about to get hit with a whole bunch of fracking and there's a bunch of fault lines that go through so it caused earthquakes so all of these women who were in their 60s and 70s and 80s and 90s um dress themselves up to look as old as possible and would go to the fracking sites and stay in a circle and knit themselves together and then when the police showed up to remove them they'd be like oh no we seem to have knit ourselves together. We're just old women. But they would call the journalists ahead of a time. So then the journalists would show up and be like, oh my God, police attack knitting nanas. <laughs> and it's, it's incredible. They wound up getting um, a fracking ban put into place, which recently got overturned. And they're back at it when we are either not shutting up enough that they can't ignore us anymore. Or if we just go and do it ourselves, we see how incredible any of these systems can be. Um, when we do not follow the rules, rules get changed. Our hope is to be able to um, encourage people to move home and live sustainably as our ancestors did, because if we're not moving home, then it's easier for in industries to come in and exploit the land. Um, it's And it there's much power in numbers. We can really change the policies if we have the power of numbers back home. Now, the movements that you wrote about um, or rather that you, you reported on seeing themselves in relation to one another in real life or, or, or only in your film? And are any of those divisions inside Navajo Nation itself, well, there in the Southwest, being mended? But a lot of these communities do not have running water, do not have electricity, don't have Wi-Fi. So they're not getting the same resources of being updated on Facebook or Instagram or TikTok about what's happening around the world. Um, a lot of the times their news sources are very limited or, quite frankly, propaganda in one way. Um, and so in a way, most of these communities are very isolated and did not know about each other. And every time that we spread and we talk about it and more and more people are getting access to cell phones and to these um, ways in which communication can grow, um, we're seeing this huge like transcontinental movement that is forming, you know, in Oaxaca with wind power. Um, we are seeing that the community wind farms are now working with organizations in Spain around community wind farms. And that's incredible. We are seeing this become a larger movement. Um, the wind that happened last October in Colombia um, in their court system that was going towards requiring mining corporations to clean up after themselves. That's huge for every every place on the planet who is currently affected by mining because um, mining corporations are not required to create clean up after themselves which is insane um that gigantic pipeline that we see in the film in black mesa will be there forever like it's not something that's going away unless we call there's a call um that is answered by these corporations and we're putting the call out and more and more people are picking up i learn constantly from the people i talk to on this program and i'm learning from you today thank you both it's just a pleasure to have you with us Thank Thanks for having us. Although, Kim, you're the best person to talk to. <laughs> <laughs> no single business has done more to persuade us that greed is good and more is mighty and big is best of all than the Amazon Corporation. So it's exciting to see Joe Biden's appointment to head the Federal Trade Commission, Lena Khan, come forward with her long-awaited suit against that company. Is Lena Calm the Ida Tarbell of our era? Ida Tarbell being the investigative journalist who pursued Standard Oil until that monopoly was broken up through the application of the Antitrust Sherman Act in 1906? Lena Khan just may be. She's had Amazon in her sights since the start of her career. But before we go too far down this road of telling an anti-monopoly story by allowing one individual to monopolize it, let's remember that 
that change takes heroic individuals for sure, but it takes many, many years and many others. In this case, 17 state attorneys general are joining in the FTC's case, great, and the pressure for it has been built by years of work by local nonprofit organizations and advocacy groups like the Institute for Local Self-Reliance, whose Stacey Mitchell and her colleagues have been after Amazon for years, exposing their abuses of their workers and their competitors in the public sphere. Can we tell an anti-monopoly story by remembering that change is made by the many? I think we can. And we try to do that here on this program. So if you want the full uncut conversation from every week's show, subscribe to our free podcast. And if you want the free offerings of all that we do here, including web exclusives and audio extras, and we have some exciting ones coming up. You can get more information about all of those at our website. Till the next time, stay kind, stay curious. For The Laura Flanders Show, I'm Laura. Thanks for joining me. For more on this episode and other forward-thinking content, subscribe to our free newsletter for updates, my commentaries, and our full uncut conversations. We also have a podcast. It's all at lauraflanders.org.